Hello everyone. Thank you Matthew and the program committee for inviting me to give the keynote talk at this symposium. I wish I could have met you all in Chicago and it would have meant a trip home for my wife. Sorry baby. I will be talking about croquet today. Let me start off with a little teaser. Croquet enables high-quality collaborative experiences on any device. Using the power of Croquet's ultra-low latency technology, complex interactive experiences are taking an enormous leap forward. This is Wide Wide World. Croquet's SDK allows us to show off incredible multiplayer interactive experiences with a brand new level of fidelity that you can't find anywhere else. Interactivity is always responsive and unbelievably smooth even when joining mid-experience. With the faster speeds and lower latency of 5G plus croquet, multiplayer experiences get even better. So what we just saw was an example of a croquet app. Two separate computers, a laptop and a mobile phone, are running the same program. The camera is following one of the agents in the program. On both systems, the agents make the same exact same decision of where to turn next at the exact same time, so that it almost looks like the phone is transparent. That's how much in sync they are. So how does that relate to collaboration? Well, let's go back. Uh, not only a few years, but all the way back to the 1960s. Doug Engelbart had published his Augmented Human Intellect Report in 1962. He argued that to solve the world's problems, our collective intellect needed to be augmented by technology. He founded the Augmentation Research Center and in 1968 demonstrated the ability of the online system NLS that his group developed. It became known as the mother of all demos. Let me play a little clip from that. And so this special thing, if I label 13, will switch, switch over. So on his display, he sees my text. So I'll execute it. And sure enough, it does. But what's that running around? Well, if he's looking at my text, he'd like to have something to say about it. So we put on a marker, a tracking spot that he controls. So he's sitting there in Menlo Park looking at this text and he can point to it, but we've carefully reserved for me the right to control and operate on this, so my bug is more powerful than yours. <laughs> but we can have an argument. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they call a bug fight. So, all right. So, uh, in case you haven't been listening, Bill, <laughs> we've been going through lots of examples, and setting up in collaboration here so that we can go on into information retrieval and we've set up now audio coupling and we're both looking at the same display and that'd be very handy to work. We can talk to each other and point and maybe later I can hand you the chalk on this blackboard like saying, here, you control it. But let's stay this mode now and add another feature that hardware-wise is available to the kind of display we have. I'd like to see you while I'm working on it. So before I can do that, I have to set up my display in a certain way. Set it up so it... I see it over like that, that leaves a corner up there, and I say, now, computer, do the automatic switching that will bring in a camera picture from the camera mounted on his console, such as the camera mounted on mine is. Hi, Bill. That's great. Now we're connected audio. You can see my work. You can point at it, and I can see your face, and we can talk. So let's do some collaborating. So, indeed, let's do some collaborating. One thing I found remarkable was that Doug joked about his bug being more powerful than builds. We do call those mouse pointers now, but instead of giving equal rights to each mouse pointer, most of today's systems only have a single pointer. What's up with that? Everything in the NLS was collaborative. 
So we want to do that with Croquet, have everything collaborative by default. That needs to be secure and fast and simple to develop. Secure because if you're collaborating and you're sharing the data with other people, you need to be sure that you're only sharing it with the people you want to have access to that data. You don't want anyone else to get their hands on it and we need to find a way to be able to trust the people providing the system even. It has to be fast, in particular uh, with the kind of real-time interaction we saw where you see each other's mouse pointers. It cannot lag by a half a second. It needs to be in real time. Same goes with augmented reality because we're talking about augmenting human conversation. So what someone else sees needs to be exactly the same that I see and it has to be updated in real time. And third, it needs to be simple to develop because if it's the default for every app, then we cannot just make it harder than it is now to develop the collaborative apps than it is for us to develop a single user app. And that's exactly what we set out to do with Croquet. It's secure, it's fast, and it's simple to develop. Let me show you. So Croquet works by synchronizing events. What do I mean by that? It means that on every user's machine there is the same virtual computer. So just like in Doug Engelbart's time where they only had one computer, the mainframe that's back in his lab in Menlo Park, we have a single computer. It's virtual, but every user gets an input line to that computer and every user gets an output line to that computer. And all you do in Croquet is program that single computer. So here my, is a sequence of events. The left user clicks, for example. That event message is sent to the reflector, which is a server in the cloud, and it distributes that same event to all the virtual computers. They all process that at the same virtual time and they update their views at the exact same time. So by sending just that one event to the reflector and having it distributed to all other users, we get the exact same update in the client. And no processing at all happened on the reflector. So this message might have triggered an extremely complicated series of computations in each client and they would all be performing the exact same thing. But that does not affect the reflector at all. The reflector just forwarded that message. So let me show you how that works in practice. Um, we have an example running at uh, codepen.io. If you scan this QR code now, then you will be able to see that um, on your phone, for example. Um, I will do the same. I have my phone here. And I'm opening it. And let me show that to you. So you see it ticking. And this is a very simple program. So it's a Hello World program. And the only interaction a user is allowed to do is tap. Oops. So if we tap here, 
the counter resets. And if any other user does that, it happens at the same time. Let me show you that that actually works uh, using my iPad. So I will scan the same QR code with my iPad. Here we go. Okay, it's loaded, it's running, and here you can see the two systems are in sync. And if I tap reset on one, oops, then it will reset on both and start counting from there again. So that's, of course, a very simple, trivial app. But the interesting thing is that this completely happened in the client. There's no server computation going on. So let me show you in more detail how we do that, how we keep these virtual computers in sync. So as I said, we have these virtual computers and reflectors. Let's get two of these. Um, so we have a reflector, we have the two users, and they're running our program. Our program is split into what we call a model, that's the virtual computer, and the view, which is the rendering machine um, that is showing the display, um, that is showing what the output is. It's the input-output. And in between those two sits the controller. The controller routes events between models and views via the reflector if necessary, but it is hidden from the application programmer. So the models and views only communicate with each other using events. This has a model and a view and a controller, but it's not quite MVC. We haven't found a better term yet. Um, if anyone has an idea for that, I would be all ears. So let's see what happens when there is an interaction. The state the system is in is in sync. We see the model in red has a value inside of it, the count value of 42. And the user clicks the reset button. The output that each user sees is also 42 right now. So when the user clicks, then the handle user input handler is activated and the view publishes an event. That event in this case is called counter reset and the controller knows that this event is subscribed by a model. So there's a model listening to that event that was published by a view and in that case the controller knows it needs to send this event via the reflector. So the event goes on the way it has an empty timestamp at the moment and the reflector puts a timestamp on it. The reflector is the one that keeps time. So timestamp gets added to that event and then the reflector sends that event to every client. And you can see they both have the exact same timestamp. They are identical. So the controller gets that event and now both controllers, every user, gets these events. The controller decides because this is coming from the reflector, it needs to create a future message. So it schedules that message for the exact timestamp that the reflector said it would need to be processed at. Then it forwards the time to that time and executes the message. In this case it's the reset counter method that gets invoked and the normal processing 
starts it the model sets this dot count to zero so that's the model updated and then the model publishes an event that's called counter update uh, and it's passing the current value of the count as an argument so we see the event here the counter update event was created and it was created in both clients the controller now decides that because this was published by a model and it's listened to by a view it can be processed locally so it just invokes that view handler directly and we see that the only action that the view handler does is taking the data that was passed as an argument and puts it to the output device and with that both users see the update at the pretty much same time it's the exact same simulation time and it's almost the same real time and this is how every single action in Croquet works any user event gets sent via the reflector and is processed by all the clients and in between those updates there is a time ticking which is 100% deterministic so the model state can advance until there are actually some external events now you might ask isn't that rather similar to a client server because we do have the separation in the model in the view so you might think that you could do exactly the same if you just had the model running on the server and the view running on the client but in Croquet both the model and view are fully client-side and that allows us some interesting things for example the view here on the right side gets a direct reference to the model right now it doesn't use that but if this was on the server like if the model was actually on the server then of course you couldn't get a direct reference to it so since we do have that direct reference to the model let's try to use it um, you might have noticed that when the view gets constructed it does not set itself up from the current model state so it takes one tick for the model to actually show the current value it could however set itself up directly from the model so to do that we can simply set the display to the count that's in the model by directly reaching into the model pulling out that value and displaying it for the user that is something that you cannot do if the model was running on the server but if we can do that then maybe we can always read from the model and in fact yes you can so if in the constructor we store the model then we can simply call the handle update method which then reads from the model so this dot model dot count is directly reaching into the model and showing what the current model state is so if we do that then there's actually no need to pass that as an argument so when the event is published there is no need to pass the this dot count to um, in the event so we can just eliminate that 
And this ability to reach into the model and display anything that is inside has a huge bandwidth effect. So not even just like this picture, but more like this picture. So if the processing in the model is very complex, let's say it's a physics simulation with thousands of particles or more, then the view can directly display the positions of all these particles by reading from the model. Whereas if, for example, that physics simulation was running on the server, then all the updates, all the positions of each particle, would have to be transmitted to the client, to each client, and that would require too much bandwidth. So that's the reason that pretty much no game that uses physics actually has meaningful physics that affects every single player. The world in first-person shooters, for example, is mostly static. So that is the croquet difference. In a classic multi-user system, the server does the computation, it sends the updates to the views, and the views send events to the server. So anything that happens as a result of the computation needs to be done on the server, and then the needs to be sent to the view. In Croquet, we call it the tea time kernel. That happens completely on the client. And that also makes it secure because the data, the application data, never actually leaves the client. If it leaves the client, it can be encrypted because all the reflector does is putting a timestamp on it. So we actually do a full end-to-end -end encryption of all the data that's leaving the client and the server has no idea. So the bandwidth with Croquet is small when it goes from the view to the model, that's the user input. Everything else is completely deterministic and the brand width is huge from model to view because the view can read directly from the model. This is also good for latency and that's how we get to be very responsive. Latency between systems is basically limited by light speed and the network hops. And 150 kilometers is about one millisecond of round trip time and light speed disregarding any intermediate network hops. So the closer the server the better. But that means if you want a server that's really close you need many 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 servers all over the world. So because the croquet reflector uses almost no CPU and is completely application agnostic. It's perfect for 5G edge computing. We soon will have hundreds of thousands of reflectors. We are in talks with 5G telecom companies. And each reflector can handle many, many applications and many sessions. And that means we can put reflectors very close to the users. In fact, we already do have reflectors all over the world. Um, this is a user map, this is even from last year, um, where we only had four clusters running um, in, in the US on the east and west coast, one in Europe and one in Asia. Um, and you can see this is on a single day the the users of where they are connecting um, from. And 
just to give you an idea, a Raspberry Pi is more than capable of running a re reflector server to to serve quite a few apps. Um, we haven't really done an, any scaling analysis yet, but this is um, a, ser a little server which we call Croquet in a Box that I demonstrated at the last Hackers Conference and it was sitting there powered by a battery um, all day um, and worked fine. So you could scan that little QR code on the display and run the the apps that were stored on that Raspberry Pi. So it had a, a web server, a reflector server, a file server, a, everything built into that one box and it's it uses so little power because any computation that's going on is happening on a client that it really worked all day. So it's demo time. Uh, let me show you a few other apps that are that we built with Croquet. So Croquet can be used for games. Um, this is a physics engine. It's actually written in WebAssembly and users can interact with it. This is the W3 demo, the World Wide Wide World demo um, that Brian Upton did. Um, this is another example of the physics simulations and um, you can see, well maybe not in this instance, but um, that everyone can interact with the with, with the physics. This is an demonstration of synchronized video display where all the videos are played in sync and this just uses the shared clock in Croquet to play back the video at the exact same time. And we not only do games but we also um, do enterprise software or work software. So this is a synchronized PDF viewer where if, if the user is scrolling, that happens exactly the same in every browser and on any device. So this is really just a demo hack. This shows 3D data being displayed in the real time so you can walk through that model and um, also put it on your phone just by scanning a QR code. Uh, it will join that session. doesn't take long. I guess the model was cached, but then you can control it from your phone or from the laptop. And we are building Q, which is a collaborative desktop environment um, that has a video chat built in, text chat built in. We are using this for our everyday meetings at the company. Um, and this is a demonstration here where we had a workshop um, with uh, about 50 participants to talk about augmented reality and croquet. So yeah, as I said in this demo reel, we just saw the WebAssembly physics, which is actually using the Rapier engine by Sebastian Crozet. Um, we had Brian Upton's Wide Wide World. We saw the synced videos and um, the various viewers um, for all kinds of documents. What else can you do with Croquet? Um, we have, for example, Zach's demos. Zach is an engineer uh, that found Croquet um, on the web and it, he's using it for all kinds of really interesting stuff. Let me show you one. So this is a leap motion device and it takes him like half an hour to make these apps collaborative because in Croquet there really is not much setup that, that you need to do. It's really just writing that code um, and 
it's like writing a single user app. You don't have to worry about servers. You don't have to set up servers um, because the reflectors are already there and running. So I really recommend you check out his um, Twitter account where he's almost posting a new demo every day. Um, another partner of us is Tilt5. Um, they're doing an augmented reality um, desktop game. So you have these little devices. Let me show you. So this is trying to demonstrate that there are two people in two different living rooms uh, looking at the same game board and they can interact with these wand devices and in this case the interaction is shared via croquet and that's actually using a unity renderer so we do have the javascript um, simulator connected to a unity renderer and if you want to check that out um, go to Tilt 5. Um, the system supports live coding. Um, if you know us, uh, we are all disciples of Alan. Most of us have worked with Alan K um, before. So one thing I want to show, because this is a software architecture conference, right, um, is a demo that Yoshiki Oshima recorded for me. Um, he implemented this in Q. So you can see we have this desktop system and there's a little workspace. Uh, there's an important expression that you can type even if you type math.random. Um, it's creating the same random um, in sync on, on both systems. and. We can paste in a little snippet of code which references the window itself, the window the workspace that this is running in. Uh, it's starting a little ticker to make it rotate. And while it's rotating, you can still edit the code and change the plus one into a minus one. And you see it's executed in real time and showing that. So. We do have an SDK and from the SDK you can um, access our developer Slack. I encourage you to go there. Uh, it does not only have the Hello World example but other examples too. Um, the class documentation isn't really big because really there are only three classes in, in the API which is the model, the view and then there's a session API. Um, and um, the, there's also something um, we have React bindings um, that are not currently um, available. Um, no, they are available. There is an NPM, so you can actually download it and use it and um, we just don't have anyone working on that right now but they are they are there um, and let me show you one little thing so this is the last time you're gonna see the, the hello world here um, which has these little methods uh, where the reset counter and the tick methods do not have the event publish um, lines because in, in this implementation um, there is an implicit publish whenever you change a property of the object. So that is something very interesting um, about this, this particular um, way of, of programming it. And um, okay to, to wrap this up is this new? Well, not quite. 
Um, the original croquet inventors were David Smith, who's our CEO now, Ellen Kay, who's on our advisory board, David Reed contributed the original idea for the tea time implementation, and Andreas Raab actually implemented it. So back in 2003, we had a croquet implementation in Squeak Smalltalk. It was a 3D operating system. It was peer-to-peer, -peer, and so that was the first working tea time implementation. Um, there still was a reflector, um, but it was hosted by one of the peers. Our new croquet began in 2018 as a uh, collaborative operating system for AR. Uh, we had various prototypes and then in early 2019 Anselm Eikhoff, who worked for us at that time, um, created the basic model view architecture with publish and subscribe. And I added the controller and reflector, the T-time protocol implementation, the snapshotting um, which is used when another user joins. And on March 7th in 2019 we had the first working T-time session. Of course we have more engineers. Um, David, as I said, is our CEO. We have the virtual DOM framework, which is behind the Q um, desktop environment by Yoshiki Oshima. Uh, Brian Upton is writing a game engine called WorldCore. Um, we saw some augmented reality and video sync demos. Those were written by Aaron Lanzer, and he's really doing everything across the whole stack. Um, the security design was done by Catherine Spears, um, brilliant engineer. The demos, as you saw, by Zach Catan and the user experience design for all of our apps um, going forward was done by Jen Evans. The new croquet is differing from the old small talk in that it was web it that it is web based. It is just a tea time kernel at the moment there is no user interface built in. It has an explicit model view separation. The model is a uses a kind of restricted subset of JavaScript, but the view you can write in, in any kind of um, way you want. It uses publish subscribed instead of far refs, um, so that was a proxy based thing back in Smalltalk. And it uses this scalable reflector network um, that we are hosting in the cloud um, instead of using peer-to-peer, -peer, um, which nowadays pretty much only works in, in the local network. So what's next? Um, one thing would be the cross-island communication. This is um, really um, an interesting thing we want to do. Um, where each island uh, can communicate with other islands. Uh, islands is what we call these virtual computers. We do want a new language um, because JavaScript is somewhat limiting and there are things that you have to be aware of. Um, as I said, in the model there is a lot of um, things to, to make sure it stays uh, deterministic. So a new language would, would help with that. And we really want a live coding environment that, that we can all work in. So let me close with a statement by Doug Engelbart. The key thing about all the world's big problems is that they have to be dealt with collectively. If we don't get collectively smarter, we're doomed. And we hope that Croquet will actually help in that. So thank you. Go check out our SDK. And I'm excited to actually meet you on Zoom in a minute. Thank you.